Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe here from East Macos, Dan. Hello and greetings. And we have today probably one of the most complex complex bits of the Solmarillion will ever present. And technically this is not part of the Solmarillion, but I consider it part of it. It's, in my opinion, the legitimate prequel to the Baron and Luthien story. And it adds a lot to Finrod Felagun's character. And not all of it is positive, but it adds layers and complexity to him and why he helps Baron. And honestly, it's such a great and important part of the story. But it's also fascinating because Tolkien introduces boatloads of lore and detail and metaphysics through a source rather similar to Plato and his writing about Socrates and himself and whatnot and their philosophies and theories and this is very much a deep dive and it's something that oh my gosh it's so detailed so to start with we're going to say that the real quick we're going to be bringing up two terms that are going to recur over and over again first is uh, the Fear, which is a plural form of Fea which is the spirit or the soul Roa, or Roar, is the body. So when it says that the Fea is consuming the Roa, this means the spirit is burning so fervently, so feverishly, it's consuming and destroying the body. And the thing is, the Roa is the body. So elves are attached to the Roa, that is to say Arda, the physical plane in some ways, Man has a stronger connection, I would argue, to the Fea, the spirit. Because when man dies, the Fea goes to a different set of the halls of Mandos and is to await the second music of the Ainur, while the elves are unsure of their fates. Um, but there's some interesting concepts introduced in this story, such as this. You tell now Finrod mentions that he's very sad at the loss of Baor. Um, and the thing is, he ends up introducing the idea that, well, what happened to Baor kind of struck him and the other elves as very, 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 very weird. And he it was something that suddenly happened. Now, Beor the Old um, arrived, and he was already fairly elderly, and he passed on the chieftainhood to his son so that he could go live with and serve and mooch off of Finrod. I'm joking. I'm going to resist the joke. But the thing is, when he dropped dead, Finrod and the other elves found this so weird and frightening that they... Honestly, it was like they lost their innocence in a way. It... In some ways, I would argue it's almost a traumatic event for them, as they had never seen someone just drop dead from old age and just slowly wither away. And this is what happened with Baor. And um, it's something that really struck Finrod and has stayed with him. Um, but... And so he, he goes to talk to a wise woman called Andreff. He comes to visit her house. Andreff is a woman with a complicated history vis-a-vis -vis the house of uh, Finarfin. And the thing is, the house of Finarfin has kind of tr treated her very badly. Um, and the thing is, Andreff, though is remarkably courteous to Finrod. After what she's gone through, like, if she said, get the hell out of here, I don't want to talk to you, she'd be well within her rights. It'd be completely understandable if she hated him. But she actually takes him into her house, feeds him, gives him wine, and just agrees to chat him up about philosophy and theology. But it also shows her intellectual side. And... Honestly, it's a little interesting how much her and Finrod have in common. The difference is, Finrod is still very much an optimist, and she's a very disappointed, romantic, and idealist. 
but we're not going to talk about her personal history until the second part. Um, there's a good reason for that. Now, Andreth talks of how uh, men were not always mortal. And obviously she's never been introduced to a certain Roman practice. Thou art only mortal, Caesar. I'm joking. Narcissist. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, the idea here is the one from The Lost Tales where uh, mortal men were distracted, so to speak, and kind of screwed up and worshipped the wrong god. Or, I should say, demon, in this case. They at first were worshipping Iluvatar, but then Melkor slipped in and pretended to be Iluvatar. And so the morals kind of got them confused and then started committing crimes. And Iluvatar then stripped them of their eternal life. Now, there's also a nod here, very evidently, to this story of the Garden of Eden. And so Tolkien can't resist slipping in a bit of his Catholicism into his mythology. So Melkor, or I should say Morgoth, the enemy of the world, ended up, according to the mythology of uh, the secondborn, that is to say the humans, the men, uh he stripped them of their immortality. In reality, it was not him, but Iluvatar, who punished them for their sinfulness. Um, and they were cursed with mortality. Um, and they apparently have a special name for Iluvatar. And the thing is, they, however, do not wish to share it um, with well Finrod so and there's talk of how there is um, there is death is a hunter it's hunting after them Finrod introduces the idea that it will always catch its prey even the elves are not immune to death. It's just coming at a slower pace. And that it catches up very quickly to humans. And so the idea is that, as uh, Andref puts it, let me just find the actual section on 273, um, where uh, she introduces the fact that they have fled from the shadow to the last shores of Middle-earth only to find it there with them. And that's obviously Melkor. But then, to get back to the topic of death, there's um, talk, of course, of who imposed death upon men. And this is where Andref asks a very interesting question. What do you know of death? You do not fear it, because you do not know it. And you have Finrod. We have seen it, and we fear it. We too may die, Andreth, and we have died. My father's father... Okay, that that's like a... My father's 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 father... <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going to go there. My father's father was cruelly slain, and many have followed him, exiles in the night, in the cruel ice, in the insatiable sea, and in Middle-earth we have died by fire and by smoke, by venom and the cruel blades of battle. Feanor is dead, and Fingolfin was trodden under the feet of the Morgoth. And you have him. For what end to overthrow the shadow, or if that may not be to keep it from spreading once more over all Middle-earth? To defend the children of Eru, Andrath, all the children, and not the proud Eldar only. And you have Andrath who then says, I had heard that it was to regain your treasure that your enemy had stolen. But maybe the house of Finarfin is... And... Ah, here it is. Lost my place for a moment. Finarfin is not at one with the sons of Feanor. Nonetheless, for all your valor, I say again, what know ye of death? To you it may be in pain, it may be bitter and a loss, but only for a time, a little taken from abundance, unless I have been told untruth. For ye know that in dying you do not leave the world, 
and that you may return to life. Now, what this shows is elves, when they die, they come back to life. They are reincarnated. Now, they don't have a memory of their previous life. They are unable to fall in love with someone else other than the one they originally fell in love with in their previous lives. Interesting detail. They just won't. And then when they reach, well, they come of age, they reach maturity, they get their memories back. And they are once again themselves. This basically means that, honestly, uh, their Fea, because it's attached to the mortal realm, is also burning through their body and in time will disappear. But on the other hand, that is if they don't go west, back to Amon. But on the other hand, there's the question of, like, how can you even compare your death to ours? Because when men die, they don't just pop back in going, Hey, guys! Man, ugh. You know, that, that incident about taking the uh, ice shard through the skull, not cool. Next time, I'd rather be steel sword through the gut. Like, that's not what happens with men. With men, it's over. <laughs> Elves, well, they don't get a, a game over sc screen. They get a do you want to try again screen. So, Andra is kind of saying... You can't really compare this. And you have Finrod. Ah! Apples to oranges. No. No, it isn't. On the other hand, you have Finrod who puts up the argument that... Um, how do I put it? When the time will come, elves do not know what will happen after the end of the world. They know that mortal men, well, have the perk of getting to sing with Eru as part of his choir. That's if they've been good. The trouble is, this isn't certain on the... Well, okay, they get to sing. Andrew then, well, her argument is, well, who decides who's good? And what happens in between? Do we just poof out of existence and poof back in? Because that doesn't sound great. So you've got here a very important metaphysical theological discussion here. Now, uh, Finrod, for his part, claims that Melkor did not impose death on mortal men. And Andreth, around uh, the next page, ends up uh, where is it? Uh, ends up commenting that um, uh, did I not say that you do not know death? Lo, when you are made to face it in thought only as we know it indeed and in thought all our lives at once you fall into a despair. We know if you do not that the nameless is lord of this world, and your valor in ours too is a folly, or at least it is fruitless. Here she's giving in to nihilism. Finra tells her, Beware, beware lest you speak the unspeakable, wittingly or in ignorance, confounding Eru with the enemy, who would have who would fain have you do so. The lord of this world is not he, but the one who made him and his vice regent is Manwe, the elder king of Arda, who is blessed. Now here we're getting into the theology. Um, and you have Finrod who's asked, Therefore I say to you, Andreth, what did you ye do, ye men, long ago in the dark? How did ye anger Eru? For otherwise all your tales are but dark dreams devised in a dark mind. Will you say what you know or have heard? And Andreth tells him, Nah, not going to tell you anything. Um... She only knows a couple of legends and stories. Um, and then she points out, um, what do any of mortal men know of the Valar? All we have is the elves' word for it. And the elves are very strange. Bear in mind, Haleth fought for the elves and then the elves. Are you on our side or against us? 
And Halas rightfully commented, If you don't, if you think I'm working for Morgoth, you are beyond all understanding and reasoning. And Halath made a good point. And that's the thing. The elves are very odd. And thing is, you have, that being said, the subject of the first encounter with the elves, and this is where Finrod mentions that the elves' hunter is a lot slower. Andreth t falls into despair um, because, well, as mentioned, it's regarding Morgoth. And it's interesting that though Finrod speaks harshly, he does try to warn her. And it's on page, well, 277, because I've got this in PDF form. And I got this in the actual uh, History of Middle-Earth edition. And I, it's just easier to cycle through the PDF version. Um, we have the reference to the Fea and the Roar. And it's interesting that he mentions the actual... Um, let me find it. Um, right, they're mentioned on 277. So, um, ah, here we are. Uh, you claim if you fully understand your own words to have had imperishable bodies, not bounded by the limits of Arda, and yet derived from its matter and sustained by it. And you claim also, though this you may not have perceived, to have had Roa and Fear that were from the beginning out of harmony. Yet harmony of Roa and Fea is, we believe, essential to the true nature, unmarred, of all the incarnate. The Mirror Mir O Anwi, as we call the children of Eru. The first difficulty I perceive, said Andreth, and to it our wise have their own answer. The second, as you guess, I do not perceive. Do you not? Um now the trouble is that, well, Finrod doesn't believe the idea that men were ever immortal. And he then makes a bit of a left turn, and um, he kind of um, gets a little arrogant and foolish. And... He compares, basically, okay, how do I put it bluntly? He claims that mortal men are visitors in Arda, in comparison to the elves. Um, and this is something that um, Andreth um, doesn't exactly welcome too much. Um and the thing is, um, well, she welcomes but doesn't. As Okay, so, uh, it is not of other regions in Arda from which ye have journeyed. We also have journeyed from afar, but were you and I to go together, you to your ancient homes east away, I should recognize the things there are part of my home, but I should see in your eyes the same wondering comparison as I see in the eyes of men in Beleriand who were born here. I believe that would be... Um, Andreth. No, that's uh, Finrod. So, you have Andreth. You speak strange words, Finrod, which I have not heard before. Yet my heart is steered as if by some truth that it recognizes, even if it does not understand it. But fleeting is the memory, and goes ere it can be grasped. Then we grow blind. And those among us who have known the Eldar, and maybe have loved them, say on our side, There is no weariness in the eyes of the elves. And we find that they do not understand the saying that goes among men. Too often seen is seen no longer. And they wonder much that in the tongues of men, the same word may mean both long known and stale. So he ends up saying, you're like visitors. You don't, ex you know, if he would, J. Jonah Jameson, Elf Edition would say, you don't belong here. In a way, no, but like, you're visitors. That's actually a very cold 
and callous thing to say. And rather arrogant, because... It's like, oh, this is our home. You, you don't exactly belong here, in a way. But the thing is, Finrod in this story is very arrogant. And the thing is, uh, as the story is progressing, he's rapidly wearing out his welcome with Andreth. But here, Andreth kind of concedes some inches and goes, well, there's some truth in what you say, but what how we would describe you elves is as stale. Which, on her end, that's like, whoa. Um, I don't think he's welcome anymore. Which, there's a difference between saying your visitor's here and you're stale. Oof. So there's and a, essentially in her own home. Yeah. Well, she accused him of being uh, long known and stale. Saying the two terms are generally interchangeable in the human tongue. The tongue of the Atani. While he ended up saying... But, Dan, it's more that he poorly worded it. It's not that he was trying to be arrogant exactly. When he said, you're like visitors here. It's just, the elves do not understand these men. Men seem to them like people who have come from nowhere and are so different. In a way, they have more in common with beasts because they're short-lived in comparison to elves. But here's the thing. Juan is one of their... Watchdogs, for example. So some of the elvish watchdogs from uh, Valinor are longer lived than men. So men are remarkably frightening to behold because they just... They are born, they grow old, then they die in a flash. So Finrod's trying to wrap his head around this. And you can't really blame him too much. This is frightening stuff. And the idea that Melkor could remove your immortality or not is something that he does say. If Melkor has that power, he's way stronger than we thought. We might be doomed. But on the other hand, he then slowly works through and says, no, I don't think he's got it. Because if he has that power, he'd have already used it. Which is very true. Only Eru has that power. Not even Manwe has it. So the thing is, it means this is why he reached a conclusion. You guys peed off uh, Eru. But on the other hand, there's a reason, and he's arriving at a conclusion, which is very reasonable, where death is really, you guys have your own separate place in the halls of Mandos, where if you truly have access to the second music of the Ainur, here's the thing, the elves who go to the halls of Mandos must actually earn the forgiveness of those they have wronged in life. They must also do so to be restored to Arda. So, like, you arrive in the halls, you have to earn the forgiveness of everyone before you can come back to Arda. Whereas for mortal men, they just, if they've been good, they don't need to earn forgiveness. They just go straight to the second music, basically, while they go to their own halls. So this is where Finrod coins the term, the gift of Eru, basically suggesting that when mortal men die, it's a gift. Because there's another perspective that Andreth has not thought of. She's busy longing for immortality in the same way many Numenorians would, in some ways. The reason it's a gift is also that the elves, as they're living through the centuries, they're just kind of going, this immortality deal is really getting to be a drag. We're so tired. It's like the Fae from FF10. We're so tired of dreaming. Except in this case, it's not dreaming, but living and living and living. Watching their friends die, their loved ones perish. And then sometimes they have to wait like a few thousand years before they could see their wife or husband again to be reincarnated or for them to be struck down in battle because they can't die to illness. So when they miss a loved one, they're screwed. So in a lot of ways, who's got it lucky? And... This is where Finrod is not being very arrogant. He's actually being very honest. You guys in some ways have a better deal because, you know, like Finrod's like, I miss Bayor. He was my best friend. And I'm never going to see him again, not even in death. That's sad. And, you know, Finrod's also basically kind of saying, you know, like, I've got my uncle, Fingolf, and I loved him. I got to wait thousands of years, possibly, to see him. Maybe hundreds. You know, like, and if he wants to see his wife again, he's got to die, earn forgiveness. 
Who knows how long that's going to take? Actually, he gets it really quick because he's that nice a guy. And then he's got a... Then he gets scuttled into Velenor. So, like... This entire process is also very bureaucratic. So Finrod's looking down the barrel of, honestly, an afterlife that's not exactly pleasant. And if he overstays his welcome Middle Earth, he disappears. He doesn't even have a soul left. While the Atani goes... Oh, they don't have to worry about that. They just go straight to the separate halls and then to the second music at the end of the world. Some of them will combat, will fight for the just cause of Eru in basically Dagor Dagorath. And then, you know, they participate in the second music after Dagor Dagoroth. So, in some ways, humans do have it better. But in other ways, the elves have it better. Like, they have stuff over each other. Death is scary stuff. It is. But you look at the elvish thing. If they keep on living, they'll disappear. But they are not, But here's the thing. They're not allowed to turn their swords on themselves to an extent. If they don't go west, they are literally screwed. So this is where this talk is very depressing. And you really do feel bad for both of them. And it's... It's very heavy stuff. Fox? I mean, she she's lived a miserable life, and it's sad that she won't have a second chance. But at least she'll be able to go properly to the afterlife. Finrod, he can have a second chance at life, but he has to go out of his way to make sure that he could go properly to the afterlife. Yep. And and even then, it's not a guarantee. There are no guarantees for the elves. The Atani, mortal men, have guarantees. The elves don't. So, really, the elves are like, holy shoot, we're really screwed. And then he releases a sucker punch. Finrod proposes the idea that when he said visitors, he didn't mean that in a negative sense. It is the Atani who will heal Middle-earth. At the music. Mortal men will heal the earth, while the elves have kind of got to prep the way for them and then pass it down. And he proposes that this is the really interesting part. He suggests that none of the Valar have actually heard the end of the first music. Or even properly remember it. And that really, like, they stopped singing. But those that came into Middle Earth did not hear the last bit. So we've got three choruses, uh, three uh, movements. We'll use symphonian terms, like terms that you would use in a symphony. So let's say this was supposed to be. Um, a symphony. We have the first music, the first song, which is, or first movement, which is for the first stage. Then we got the second. Then we got the third. Now, we, as readers, know the, that the Valar, for the most part, know up to the third movement. There's seven ages. There are four movements they didn't listen to. That's not a little detail. They basically enter the world blind. In some ways, blinder than the elves and men. So no wonder they're mucking it up. They actually have no idea about the future or what they're doing. They're making it up as they go along. Eru, though, has seven movements. Seven ages. Whoa. Now, in Tolkien's Legendarium, the idea is you have the seven movements, then Dagger Daggeroth. Now, the idea is kind of Manway has moments of insight into those later movements. But most of the Valar and Meyer never even heard the last bits. And this idea is proposed by Finrod, who theorizes this is why they're doing such a bad job. They did not listen to the end. Basically, they're like, all right, roll credits, we're going. But let's make a comparison to also, let's say, watching The Lion King. They're like, 
We made it through the circle of life. All right, roll credits, let's go. You didn't even see to the end. You didn't even see to the beginning. You didn't even make it to, I can't wait to be king. You just simply said, roll credits. That's the entire film. I have like no Thimba learning what, uh, not to go to the elephant graveyard and that kings get scared. But imagine... No, no uh, going to meet up with Timon and Pumbaa. Hell, even um, imagine this. Imagine Lion King as a separate world. You only listened or watched up to the circle of life. Then you jump into that world in order to play it being its god without knowing the story. Then you, you don't know the lessons. Do you think you'd be a good help to Simba? No. So that's what the Valar did. That's what Finrod's starting to theorize. And I'm like, holy shoot, that makes so much sense. And you're left going, oh, for heaven's sake. So we have the Valar descending into Arda. But they really went in blind. They basically went and jumped in before they listened to the last bit. So Arda was created along the various ages. You know, like, the different m movements are the different eras, the different ages. So what this means is that they basically jumped in half-cocked before they had even heard the rest, even as it was being sung. Now, we have to bear in mind there are Einar who do not jump in right away, and many of them became Maiar. So, obviously a lot of the Ainur remain behind to sing out the last few stages. Now, they must have jumped in after the third movement, is the theory here. Possibly the fourth. I would argue the third. We're going off what the elves know. So, really, Eru basically said, behold your work. Now let's get back to singing and dancing. So, this is a very important detail to the story. This is completely like heck it it's even comparable to oh i'm gonna play uh the fifth symphony but i never even heard past the second movement how are you supposed to complete the rest ah i'll wing it you can't just wing beethoven Eh, watch me well that's basically the mentality the valar took this yeah it's fascinating and incredibly dumb, but it explains a lot. And, yeah. And Finrod then happens upon the idea, well, if mortal men are jumping straight to the music, we're all one big happy family then. Because, you know, you'll you'll back us up at the end of the world, right? You'll, you'll vouch for us, right? Right? Yeah, you could hear the begging. <laughs> but we'll explore that idea and the other half of the ideas in the next video. Uh, so don't forget to smash that like, that subscribe button. Check out our sub stack and subscribe over there for our newsletter where we write a ton of great novels in a Tolkienian mythological way and manner. And check out our book, Crown of Blood, which is a fantastic book. People really like it. So do check that out.